so I moved to New York when I was 20. I just did a couple of Super Indies uh, in a row. And I was kind of like, yeah, I want to be like a serious actor doing dark little Indies and stuff. But then I realized that I had to pay my rent. Sex in the City. I guess that was my first role on a TV show that was on the air. I played a character who could only have sex in public places. Like he liked the idea of getting caught. It was fun because the character was kind of absurd and it sort of struck a chord. I remember being in a Bed Bath & Beyond and somebody saying, oh man, I saw you were, were you just on Sex in the City? And I was like, um, yeah, I was, what's it to you? The Sopranos. I knew the casting director on that, George Ann Walken, and she said, they're looking for a new character. Will you come out and meet David Chase out at Silver Cup in Queens? And I was like, all right. So I get out there and then when I got there, she goes, listen, he's written one line for this next episode where you, this guy would just have one line. I was like, okay. And she goes, you know, would you read this one line? So I walk in and he's there, how you doing? I sit down and I'm holding my, and she goes, um, you ready to go? And I go, yeah. And she goes, okay. And actually, and I go, line? It, we had killed in that room. And um, he liked it a lot. David Chase liked it. Hello. Yeah, she's here. She's on duty today. The same, undercover. And that, I think that's how I got the part, just because I was ballsy enough to do that, I guess. I, ballsy is a big word. Arrested Development. It's kind of a long story, but it, like it, it came about because I lost another job the year before and I was really bummed out about it. I did this show called Michael Malley Show with a bunch of friends in 1999, but my character got written out when it went to series and I was kind of taking it hard and I was decided that I wasn't gonna do any more TV. I was really gonna stick it to the TV biz, like they'd notice. And, um, and then this part came uh, about and uh, I went in, I, I sort of begrudgingly, I kept saying, I don't want to, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to read for anything. And they said, just, this woman called me and she said, it's a great part for you. So I went uptown and I took the subway and reading my, um, my sides and um, put it on tape and then forgot about it. And then the next day they're like, um, you know, they want to fly you to California to come read for this, for the network. I was like, um, all right, let me check my sketch. I didn't have a schedule, that was the thing. And then, yeah, that just kind of changed everything. In the second season, I, I feel like we really kind of found our groove and got good at doing certain things and understanding what really makes the show work. Even the third season, you know, I think we started to get, the writing was on the wall that it was gonna get canceled. And so then we were sort of driven by Defiance as the kind of the underdogs. Um, and that kind of drove story a lot. And there, there was always a kind of, a gallows sensibility to it as well, just because there was this looming, um, you know, axe that was gonna end the show. I get people running up and asking me to do, they'll just yell, come on in my face, or they'll ask me to do a chicken dance, or they'll ask whatever. Um, and you know, it's it's great. I'm, I'm always happy when people are an actual fan of the show, and they're like, I love the show, and here's why, and I love this, and I love, and they're really into it, then, yeah, you got all the time in the world for it because you're doing something that you want, you want people to enjoy and to get something out of. How are your real life magic skills? My real life magic skills are super bad. Dirty Rock. I was really happy when I um, got an email from, from Tina saying, you know, we've got this character that I think that you'll dig. I didn't really know Alec that well. We'd met a few times, but, um, you know, just such a fan. I think that he's superior performer. He just oozes it. He's just so incredible. So I was psyched. We had a lot of fun because our characters were, you know, they were such sort of like arch versions of uh, of ourselves or whatever. We would have a lot of, we have a lot of face-offs, like actual face-offs where faces and our noses got really close to each other and we both kind of lower our voices as much as we could. And the worst part is, I wouldn't even want the money. No, you wouldn't. Jack Downing, you taking welfare to kill you. There's so many jobs at stake. You'd have to take it. I'd make you, I'd make you take it all. Well, I'd roll over and let you give it to me. I'm honestly not trying to make this sound gay. No one is, it's just happening. Plus, you know, my character was kind of insane. I'd have a lot of like insane entrances and exits that would always make us laugh. Like just come, my character would often come like kind of wheeling into the room like, let me tell you something, Jack, you know. 
coming off of Arrested Development, it was a little bit of a different vibe, but uh, also just in pursuit of the same thing, which was um, just to make people laugh. You always find that, that when you work on shows like Arrested or 30 Rock, um, that the one kind of common theme with the people involved is that they're really just trying to make each other laugh in the process. Like that's where the magic is. And if that happens, then it, then it usually translates. Hot Rod. That was a really fun experience. I, you know, I, of course I knew Andy. They were on SNL at the time. Um, Andy was on it and uh, Akiva and Yorm were writing on it and making their digital shorts. Andy had been on um, Arrested, he had a small part in Arrested, and uh, Hot Rod, they started writing that, and then they said, hey, why don't you come and do it? And I remember flying to Vancouver, and, and like on the plane, an hour into the flight, thinking like, oh man, I'm, I'm getting super sick right now. Like, it's just one of those. And I was in Vancouver for like three days shooting all my stuff for Hot Rod, and I was crazy sick the entire time I was shooting that. So I was on like antihistamines and stuff, I was kind of out of it, and doing that insane character, and you know, people are trying to stay away from me because I was, you know. So it was such a kind of a hazy, experience, such a weird experience for me that when people often say to me like, hey man, I love Hot Rod and I love that thing and I'm kind of, I'm kind of like, oh yeah, like <laughs> my memory of it is so foggy. Um, but it was really, it was really fun and, and Danny McBride is somebody, you know, who was in it as well and uh, Hater is in it and it was like just a fun cat. And then Isla, who I think is super, super funny, um, you know, she's one of those people, she's just a naturally funny person. Very fond memories. One of my favorite scenes is the babe scene. Yeah. Goodbye. Babe, wait. Babe, wait. Babe, wait. Babe! Babe, wait! Babe, babe, babe! Babe, wait, babe, no! Babe, no! Babe, no! Babe! I was just trying to make like Yorma and Akiva laugh and Andy laugh. <laughs> I think, again, I think I was kind of out of it and they just didn't yell cut. So it just kept going, babe. And I'm just like, well, if you guys don't yell cut, I'm just going to keep going. And, um, and I don't care, you know, and, uh, that's how that kind of came about. Again, I was, you know, always just trying to make them laugh. Like you, you just want them to break, you know? So I will do whatever it takes to kind of fuck with them. And then that's what they end up using. <laughs> Blades of Glory. That movie was a really fun experience because we, we shot the first uh, few weeks up in, in Canada, in Montreal, crazy cold. Day one, we did this scene, I remember, where we are running into the mall. We're both slipping because we're on our skates. And it was just so physical. It was truly just two 10-year-olds playing you guys were actually on skates doing that? Yeah, we were on skates and then we had to get them locked in the um, in the grooves of the escalator. That to me is like a, such a funny comedic beat, which is the wild chase, then they get stuck for a second, they can't change the space because they're both locked in, and they're forced to have a kind of a conversation where, and Will kind of turns to me and says like, who are you supposed to be? And I'm like, it's JFK. Hey, who, who are you supposed to be anyway? Rod Serling? JFK. It's gonna make sense. No, 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 it'll be fine. We got to do a lot of skating, which, you know, as a Canadian, I, I can skate a little bit. So of, of the four people who were really featured skaters in the movie, um, I, I got to do probably the most actual skating, um, which was fun. The brother Solomon. Brother Solomon was one of the funniest, if not funniest script I've ever read. Forte and I are good friends, but uh, back then um, he was on SNL and he had had all these drawings and he had all this weird stuff about these two brothers, these characters he wanted to do. He gave me the script and he said, I, you know, I've been thinking about these two characters who are brothers and I've got this script that I wrote basically for us to do, for you and me to do. You know, and somebody says that and you're kind of like, well, well, let's see. And it was just unbelievably funny and brilliant and so specific. And so specific to Will too. He's one of those guys, like I, he really makes me laugh. I just love his perspective. I think it's so interesting and funny. I don't know if we executed it perfectly. I've always felt like it deserved a little bit better. Um, and I used to joke, we should go back and remake it and the budget should be what it made on its opening weekend. And it only made like the opening weekend, it was something crazy. It was like 
550 grand or something. <laughs> that was it, like the, the definition of a bomb. Bojack Horseman. So Raphael, Bob Waxberg, who created this show, he and I have the same manager, and Raphael wrote this script. It's about a guy who's a horse living in a world that's populated by animals and humans and stuff. And I was like, oh, sounds great. Uh, and then, um, so I read it, and it was just instantly really funny and different. We didn't have a, a deal with anybody to make, so we made like a short presentation. And then we went out with it, and everybody passed on it. And... Um, and it almost happened, we almost sold it to a network, and then at the last minute, they backed out. And so there was, it looked like it was just dead. Then Ted Sarandos watched it, and he was like, yeah, I like this. I think it's funny. You guys can make it here. And we were like, oh, uh, really? Great. Because I don't think that any kind of market research would bear out that there'd be an audience for it. it takes lots of uh, dips and turns and um, really surprising a lot of levels. It's been one of those things that I've been really proud to be a part of. Weirdly, it's a story told about and, and by, you know, animals and whatever, insects. And, and yet, funnily enough, all the, the stories are actually very human stories. The Lego Movie. I knew Phil and, and, and Chris. Um, we had worked together on a, they made a film called Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. And originally, I was, was going to do that. Um, and... They had a much darker vision for that film originally, and the studio got scared, and rightfully so. It's not going to attract a big kid's audience, and what are we doing here? They threw the whole thing out, and that included uh, me and, uh, and Amy uh, Polo. We were both doing it together. So I think Phil and Chris felt kind of bad about it. <laughs> and so a couple of years later, they called me one day, and they're like, listen, we're making the Lego movie, at Warner Brothers, and we want you to play Batman, and we're gonna put a thing in your contract where nothing can happen to you, and we feel so bad about what went down. Like, it was all like in one sentence. I was like, guys, first of all, Lego movie, I don't know what that means, but sure. And also, we're fine. Started recording and trying to find the voice of Batman and what was making us laugh about him. Well, yeah, it was really making fun of Christian Bale. It, it was more like, Looking at as the Batman have progressed, it's gotten that voice has gotten more and more deep and raspy, and kind of feels almost like a caricature. Like it's it almost sounds like somebody else is saying it. You know, you see him as Bruce Wayne, and then he puts the cowl on, he gets in the car, and he's like, "Where are we going? Let's go there now." You're like, "Wait, what happened?" And we just love the idea of seeing that guy having that voice all the time in every aspect of his life when he's making food, when he's trying to order a movie when he's, you know, doing whatever. Teen Titans go to the movies. Working on, on like a voiceover, do you interact with your fellow actors or is it kind of like to see each other and like, oh, hey. For the most part, you don't work together. Teen Titans go, I did, um, I did most of it on my own. And play Slade, which is Robin's nemesis. Mm -hmm. And Jimmy Kimmel actually plays Batman. Yeah. I'm Batman. Batman returns. Batman forever. There is no stopping the Batman. Yeah, well, you know, I'm really regretting asking Jimmy to do it now because he's been shoving it in my face a little bit and he, he was hell-bent on making sure my kids knew. We were on spring break and he was like, he says to my kids, like, so your dad told you, right, that there's a new, new Batman. We good? Are we wrapped, wrapped in here? We are wrapped.